Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. I'm sitting outside Pete's house in beautiful Tustin, California. It is early in the morning. The sun is just coming up and the birds are chirping. So if you hear that in the background, just know that they're helping me hang up the sun this morning. Our guest today is Sean Kanan. He's the author of the new book, Success Factor X, Inspiration, Wisdom, and Advice from 50 of America's Best. It's an exploration of what it takes to succeed from some of the most successful people in the world, including Tony Robbins, Mark Cuban, Ken Shamrock, Don King, Jason Alexander, and Sarah Blakely. Sean has himself succeeded as an actor, a producer, and a writer. His previous book was called The Modern Gentleman, Cooking and Entertaining with Sean Kanan, where he shared his approach and his tips to creating meaningful connections through providing an experience that nourishes the body, the spirit, and the curiosity of your guests. And he does it with a style and an execution that has landed him key roles in daytime dramas and feature films alike. You probably know him from his longtime starring roles on General Hospital, The Bold and the Beautiful, and The Young and the Restless, as well as his breakout role as Mike Barnes, the bad boy of karate, in The Karate Kid 3. And he continues to create in a variety of media every day. Speaking of which, we continue to create every day too, just for you. And if you're into these topics and we're helping you to be more informed about them, do us a big favor and support the Break It Down show with a five-star rating on iTunes or Stitcher or iHeartRadio or whatever platform you use to listen to us. And if you're listening on YouTube, please subscribe and hit that notification bell so you're always abreast of our new episodes. You don't have to write them in Italian, French, Russian, Mandarin, or Japanese. All things Sean can do. But a couple of thoughts about the show in whatever language best suits you would be great, and we'd appreciate it. And we think you're really going to appreciate our guest today, whose books you can buy in physical form or for your Kindle on Amazon. Here's Sean Kanan. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Hey, this is Sean Kanan, and you are listening to The Break It Down Show, and I'm here to gratuitously plug my new book, Success Factor X. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, so Success Factor X, I read it, and it's fantastic. You guys got a bunch of insight from people like Tony Robbins, just to keep the list short, but the list is incredible. It is. On success and like their advice specifically, and sometimes it's... 10 words sometimes it's a paragraph but it's just dense with quality stuff and i love it yeah yeah you know it's it's interesting that you say that because when we were compiling the book some people's submissions were very long yeah and some people's were very short yeah and we were a little concerned i was like oh my god okay this guy that's he's a big name is giving us a very short submission but the thing is it's like everybody has an internal barometer about what success means to them and if you can convey that in a few sentences, yeah. that's, that's amazing. And, and, you know, and we were, we were constantly surprised with the people that we got to participate in the book. It's incredible. You know, we really yeah. were amazed. I mean, the quality of, you know, a, a, a Mark Cuban, Sarah Blakely, the first female billionaire. Yeah. I mean, we got some really amazing people. And then some of the people are not household names. And I thought that was really interesting, too, because I didn't want everybody to be a household name. I wanted some people. Your daughter's looking at her watch, by the way. And uh, <laughs> no, but it was it was really it was really cool that like some of the people maybe were introducing to the readers of the book for the first time. Uh, like, like one guy that is is somebody that is a personal friend of mine and he's an amazing individual is Jay Dobbins. Right. And Jay Dobbins looks like a hell's angel scary looking dude yeah. right and jay is an ex atf agent alcohol tobacco and firearms agent who infiltrated the hell's angels and brought down a chapter of the hell's angels and he is a legitimate american hero yeah this guy and jay it's so interesting how i met him i i was watching a tv show and i saw jay and i was like i want this guy for my book 
And I go, I'm going to try and find him. And I don't know how I did it. I found him and I contacted him and said, hey, my name's Sean Cannon. I'm doing this book. He goes, can you be in um, uh, Tucson, Arizona tomorrow? And I was like, yeah. Yes. So I call my wife and I'm like, babe, we're flying to Tucson. We're going to go hang out with Jay Dobbins, this guy I just met. And he's like, if you can be there, I'm going to take you on a bust. And so basically, it was a multi task force bust. Um, he picks me up at my hotel at like four in the morning and he's like, we're going to let you watch what it's like to bust all these bad guys. And it was the most amazing, weird, bizarre, cool thing I've ever done. Yeah. And so we became friends and I was in Tucson with Michelle, my wife, two months ago. And Jay is speaking at the University of Arizona and it's him and another guy who's like police officer. And he's, they're addressing all these young kids that want to be police officers. Forgive the women to say this, okay? I don't mean to be disrespectful. But he's like, he's like you look at me. And he said, who the fuck is going to take on the bad guys? He goes, he goes, some guy that looks like, you yeah. know, this guy with a pencil in his pocket. He goes, you need a bad guy like me to be the guy that takes on the bad guys. Yeah. And, and, and Jay looks like, if you Google him right now, his name's, it's worth doing. Yeah. His name's Jay Dobbins. <laughs> he looks, he's got like a weird twisty beard and tattoos. He, he had to figure out a way to look like he had killed some people without obviously killing some people. So they took like, I don't know, it was like turkey sausage. They had his, um, it's called a cut, you know, a, a mm -hmm. cut. And they put srirachas, whatever. They made it look like they killed this guy. Yeah. And he's just one of the most fascinating human beings I've ever met. And he's one of the coolest, most fun human beings. Because you would think like a guy from the ATF is like a stiff. Yeah. And Jay's real fun to go out with. So my point is, cir circumventing back to what I was saying, was uh, some of the people in the book are not household names. They're not like the Tony Robbins, the Mark Cubans of the world. And you learn about them and you're like, wow, these guys are really fascinating. Hey, this is Pete. Real quick, I just want to let you guys know we are proud to announce our official support of Save the Brave, a certified nonprofit 501c3 with a charter of helping veterans with post-traumatic stress. Here's how you can help. Go to savethebrave.com, click on the link on the website, and my recommendation is this. Subscribe. Give them 20 bucks a month. You've got subscriptions that you can turn off right now that you're not using that are $20 a month. Swap that out. Get involved. Let's help these folks out. So my point is, cir circumventing back to what I was saying, was uh, some of the people in the book are not household names. They're not like the Tony Robbins, the Mark Cubans of the world. And you learn about them and you're like, wow, these guys are really fascinating. Yeah, there's a, a thing I believe in from my time doing similar work. And I'm not doing what Jay did, but, you know, very dangerous work. Right. You get a, a clarity, what, what I call the ground truth. So up at FBI headquarters or ATF headquarters, that that reality is a complete, it's, you're in a spaceship. Right. Looking down on a continent, you can't even comprehend. 30,000 square, 30,000 right. foot yeah. view. So you yeah, can't even yeah, yeah. see where Jay is at and understand what he has to understand. And when those things don't intersect ever, it's hard for the organization to get what it wants because you can't line the tactical and the sub-tactical. Right. The grit with the organizational strategic goal. They're just not in alignment, well, you know? I hope at some point, that our friendship grows. And I, I hope that I'm able to introduce you to this guy because I think you would really dig him. So he wrote a best-selling book called No No Angel when he took down the Hells Angels. And now they're making a movie of his life. And, you know, it, it, the whole thing is like he's balancing. He's got this nice, beautiful wife. He's got this kid. He's like a little league coach. And on the weekends, he's leaving and he's going and... They can't do drugs right. when you're an ATF agent. So he's pounding like herbal stimulants so he can compete with these guys that are doing crystal meth. Uh -huh. And like like one time they were going to kill a guy and the guy was a an informer. And so Jay had to beat the shit out of this guy because that was the lesser evil of letting this guy get killed. Yeah. So he, he basically grabbed this guy. He's punching him, punching him, but he's throwing him out of the bar. Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, he's doing it to get him out of the situation. Right, right. And you're just like, holy crap, right. this is crazy shit. And when you have to 
when four levels above you, they're briefing that Jade is yes. the shit out of a guy. Yes. Someone's got to be there to be like, I'm positive Jay made the right decision, you know? He saved this guy's life. Right. He beat right. the crap out of him mm-hmm. and hurt him. Right. But he saved his life. Right. But that, that is what's great about the book is that you guys do cover that full spectrum. Because I remember the, uh, the Jay segment was great, and I resonated with it because, again, we don't do the same thing, but I've got to go make friends with the worst people on the earth that right. I can find right. in the area. Because the people that have the dangerous information are the dangerous people. Right. You know? Yeah. So I have to build trust with the Taliban. Genuine trust. Let me ask you a question. I know now it's starting like I'm interviewing your dad. No, it's a conversation. But do you ever find yourself like on a weird level? Here, these guys, they're the enemy. Uh huh. But you can't help but having some kind of almost a weird respect for them. And then you feel guilty for that because they're the enemy. But even though you diametrically are opposed to what they believe, their level of commitment yeah. on some level. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's is that, is that like, I mean, you have to respect them on some you level. You have to have. So, is, is that weird? Yeah, no, not at all. Like, cross culturally, you have to, you don't have to accept what they do, right? But you have to un- understand it. Like, their situation, their uncles. If you were to put yourself in there, how would you be different? How would you be different if your right. your wife is getting bombed? Yeah. I mean, I mean, maybe, yeah. maybe this yeah. is how you make money, and it's the only way you have to make money is to, right. you know, endeavor in, in things that are extra right. legal or illegal. Yep. So. I, I for sure, you know, there, you it. there has to be an exchange of respect to get to trust. You have yes. to. Yeah. And if I don't have a trust, so I, I work on like, what do they need help with right now? Immediately. Right what now, can like, I do for you to? Yeah. And yeah. it's not, it's not like build a 10 story a training academy. You know, it's really simple stuff. Like, can really I feed th- you? Can I feed you? Yeah. Can I help you? Yeah. I mean, like we have homeless people two blocks from here, right? If you went over there and said, how can I help you right now today? Make your life 5% better. It's funny you brought that up. Hmm. I just finished a movie with Steven Seagal and DMX. And we shot the movie at 666 6th Street, which uh-huh. is, is directly across from Skid Row. And so the facility we were in, it, it has um, fencing and it's protected. But there's a guy that's the caretaker of this building, right? And he says, listen, he goes, um, he says, uh, you know, I know you're looking at these people and, and you, 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 you want to be empathetic. And of course you do. Of course you want to be empathetic. Yeah. But he's like, there's a flip side to that reality, which is so many people come down. They bring them sandwiches. They bring them clothes. They bring them this and that. And these guys have gotten really good at gaming the system. And they go, imagine you own a business. And now, because you're in a city that's a sanctuary city, that it is inappropriate to be angry about that. And now you built this business that protects your family, that feeds your family. And these guys are here parked in front of your, you know, your, your front lawn. And you know, there's two sides to it. Anyway. The reason I brought it up was because I, I did this movie and our, our call times were at four in the morning. So, like, I'm arriving at four in the morning on Skid Row. And, I mean, it was like nothing to see people smoking crack, yeah, having sex, rats. I mean, it was like you see the worst of the worst of the worst of, of humanity. Yeah. Not that they're the worst of humanity, just where things can go when right. they're horribly wrong. And then when you do a movie... You have to eat your food. It's it's every six hours is when. So imagine we get there at four in the morning. Lunch is at ten in the morning, ah. and you're eating this exorbitant, wonderful meal. And these homeless people are walking by, and you feel really yeah like a bad human being that you're, and you literally cannot give them food because it's a whole yeah. Anyway, it was weird. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah. Well, that like you think about the homeless folks that are out there doing that with rats and crack and sex, you know they're doing what we all do, right? Basically, don't have any walls, you know, so it's just in the open. You know, I'm not smoking crack though. No, but I'm there's not people crack. that 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 drink too much or they smoke too much or they pill too much or whatever, you know. <laughs> and it's no commentary, but it's things. It's their life is in the open. My point is not to assign blame to anybody or put anything on anybody, but when you go into that environment, as me, right? I've now got to understand what it's like to be them. To walk in their shoes. Right. To walk in their shoes. Yeah. And so if I can bring their reality to our side and say, here's their reality. Here's where they need help. So I got this piece from the Bhagavad Gita that's my my meditative piece. 
and I'm not going to bore you with it, but the essence of it is it says he lives in wisdom who sees himself in all yeah. in all in himself. And it's like, you know, I may not agree with it, mm. and I may think you're acting like an asshole, but I'm going to look at you and, and, and go, what if that was me? Yeah. Try and get a different level of understanding. And the ethics in these situations are different. Jay had a different ethical reality where he's picking something that everybody else would say is unethical. So listen to what happened to Jay. Yeah. So Jay was a brilliant football player, and he went to the Combine. You know uh-huh. what that is, right? Yeah. You know what the Combine is? The Combine is where they take all prospects, the hot prospects, and all the owners of the teams have scouts, and they decide whether they want to make them an offer to. Yeah. So Jay was like a big-time football player for University of Arizona. He says, within 10 minutes, I knew I wasn't going to make it to the pros. But he says that the two guys that were competing against him at the combine were Jerry Rice. <laughs> and like, it like these are Hall of Fame football players. So he's like, I knew I was going to do this. So Jay joins the ATF. Okay. Within three days of being in the ATF, for some facocta reason, he gets put in an undercover situation he had no business being in. He gets shot, Whoa. left for dead. Three days after. He gets out of the academy for some reason. He's in the frickin' and um, a lawyer calls him up and he's like, dude, you can write your own ticket. You can get millions. He goes, I don't want millions. He goes, I came here to serve my country. Wow. He goes, I just want to. So that's the guy. I mean, he's yeah. he's an American hero. Yeah. This guy. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the guys that I know that are in that kind of work, you know, it's different. The, the, but he almost died. I mean, no, he, I mean for sure. Just that once. You know, come on. It's just a lot of danger in what he did. Did you look him up? You see what he looks like? Yeah. I mean, he looks like a badass, right? Yeah. Like, you want no part of Jay. Right. I mean, I've studied martial arts all my life. I'm not a pussy. But, Jay, you want no part of Jay Dobbins angry with you. Well, there's <laughs> you know? a, there I mean, comes a point, like, and you probably have this, there comes a point where it's like, oh, there's going to be a fight? I- I'm not worried about winning. I'm worried I, about not getting hurt. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, well, but even if, I, like, you can punch me in the face all you want. Right. That ain't going to be enough. Right, so, right. You may beat me, but guess what? There's going to come a whooping with it, you know? And the guy who doesn't care if he wins or loses is just That's the guy, yes, yes, exactly. And I got to imagine Jay's that guy. He's like, yeah, whatever, you know? He's, um, plus, I mean, he can ride a bike. I mean, he's an interesting cat, man. Yeah. And he's, the thing that's interesting is he looks like a, a dangerous Hells Angel guy. Yeah. But he's really erudite. I mean, he's very, very smart and educated. I mean, he teaches classes on the college level. Right. You know, I mean, it's almost like he's created this persona because he he has to look this way to do what he like what you talked about with you. Yeah. But like it's it's a part he's playing. Uh huh. You know? Yeah. So you think about this, like when I do my job, let's say I'm in Bosnia, right? We talked about that earlier. When a farmer offers me some of his homemade brandy, his Shlivovitz, right? Or yeah, rock yeah, yeah, depending yeah, yeah. on where you're at. Yeah. You say yes. And when he brings you medium rare pork, he killed from his pig. Trichinosis. Yeah. You say yes to trichinosis because you've got a bigger mission, a bigger purpose. You're like, <laughs> right? Right. So it seems sexy, but when right. you've got dysentery, ah, you right. you got to do what you got to do. But you have to do it. I mean, and certain people say they won't, but they shouldn't be in the field. It's, but you're insulting them. Right. And, you, and it's okay to, like, have a barrier, and maybe it's you won't eat the food, but right. you have to know how to get around that. Right, right. And just saying, because right. usually everybody who I talk to, who not really, I don't want to be disrespectful, them, they don't have the level of pro capacity that I have. Right. Or whether I'm eating the food or not, they're not prepared to get around that situation. Like, they're just not, that's a hard wall for them. So they really should be analysts or planners or something yes, else. Yes, not field guys. Right. And so a guy like that may have a win here and there, but a guy like Jay is going to win all the time because he gets around that. Do you mind if I ask, what, what, was, your, what was your rank? I was in E5. I was a sergeant. Sergeant. So fairly low ranking, but so, I always worked well above. Do you know who's a buddy of mine? Do you know who Terry Shepard is? Yeah, I, I actually got his Terry's yeah. Terry's in the book. Yeah. Oh, that's so right. Yeah, yeah. Terry's yeah. in the book. Terry's like my my guy. I yeah. love Terry. Yeah. Terry's supposed to come on the show. We just never hook up and do oh, it. Oh, you gotta get Terry. Yeah. Terry's Terry's, great. Have you ever seen uh, Dude You're Screwed? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> a great show. That's great. Dude, Terry's, Dude You're Screwed Terry's is like a the, maniac. Yeah, the, it's a bunch of operators, and they kidnap each other and put them mm-hmm. in possible situations. They're like, see you, dude. And then it's, it's sort of like Naked and Afraid, but with operators. And, and so they're I like, mean, you just, get a stick, you get this goat you got to bring back with you, and 
you know, this whole situation. And then they and they and it's it. cool because they, they get they give you like several items. Yeah. And you think, OK, they give you lipstick and say a clown mask. Yeah. And, and what these guys are going to do is they're going to kidnap you and drop you off in the worst, most inhospitable place. In the world. But then you start thinking lipstick has emollients in it emollients yeah. make really good what do you call it incendiaries yeah you know it's a great way to light a fire and so the the mask is a great way to scoop water i mean it's like all these stupid yeah. things have great yeah applicability value. yeah then they run them into like a an abandoned old and all that dude, stuff terry is just one of the funniest yeah. smartest toughest weird we're, he's a weirdo yeah he's a weirdo i love terry but he's a weirdo and all those guys are alpha alphas. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, you and I are kind of alphas. Yeah. This guy's an alpha. Right. Yeah. So when you're in that world and you're trying to operate with those guys. You're going to out alpha them. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't ever choose to. I right. just go do my stuff. And then when I open my mouth and I say what I've got to say, I'm ahead of them in my field. Right. And so I don't have to out alpha them. They already know that in terms of collecting, I meant right. worse, their peer. Right. right. You know, if right. not. Right. Their teacher, but that requires a surrendering of ego. Like, yeah, go ahead, go. Like, everybody out wants to outshoot the the weapons expert on a soft right. team, and then that grit, that ruggedness, that alpha to alpha connection means that they have this reality, this wisdom, and it's super plain. But I, you, you know, know, I think I think if you meet a guy like that, and if he's a guy, and generally my experience has been that most military guys are very humble and respectful. They're not, you know, they'll kill you, but they're yeah. not dicks. Yeah. And when you meet those kind of guys, it just immediately brings a sense of, wow, I'm impressed and, and I'm not articulating it really well, but I'm, I'm just saying you immediately like, that's a guy that I want to, yeah. I want to know. Well, it makes sense. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. because of what they've been through. If it's not bullshit and obviously you're not and Terry, whatever, it's yeah. like, wow, I really want to. But that's that's what men aspire to. If you want candid answers, you ask a special operator. Not so much seals, but not not them. <laughs> wait, 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 are you bad nothing seals? No, 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 no. I'm just saying that more of the special operations, the Green Beret. What do you guys. think about this whole court case going on? So, I know a lot of these guys, right? And like personally, you mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so, and, what, is, did the guy do it? I mean, I don't know. That's not for me to say. But I do know this: that the ethics in combat are different than ethics here at Vespao, downtown LA. I get it. I get it. But also, the military court system has leaves a lot to be desired for being, look, if you have the ability to put someone in jail for the rest of your life, you need to be above reproach. They aren't. Yeah. I oh. mean, that's, that's really where it stops. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, the way you care for everybody. There's a, I mean, let me give you an example. There's a case. We don't got to get into the case. But bottom line is, is it's very questionable as to what happened. Did he or didn't he, right? But at one point, the military police had lost the custody of the evidence for three months. That's ridiculous. Right. He's, I mean, if that happened in a civil court or, yeah. or in a criminal court in the United States, right. it would be absolutely like reason, said, yeah. reason for uh, Even if he uh, did this it. trial. Yeah, you can't do it, right? Yeah, so uh, he's in jail still. And so when you have these things where, like, Eddie Gallagher and these other guys are, are struggling to get out, you're taking things out of context and not playing by the rules. This is my layman's opinion, and you're a soldier, so you can tell me. But I think the thing that differentiates us from other people is, and it has not always functioned perfectly, my of lie, of course. Yeah. But pretty much our soldiers are not going to go and rape women. Yeah. They have a code of honor. Yeah. You know, they are the American military. Yeah. And if they're not the, I don't know what military, but you yeah. know, you have, you have a certain level of expectation that there's going to be at least within the parameters of war, which is horrible. And I can only imagine yeah. there's going to be a level of conduct that is right. Am I right? Or yeah, no, hundred percent. And among the peer nations who go out and do things with us, we are seen as, the number one, like, because look, it's not only the proficiency with the weapons and, and the character. It's the conduct. Yep. It's and the conduct. The self-development. And the thing is, and Terry used to always tell me this, he goes, spec. the difference between a spec ops and a grunt mm -hmm. is it's how can I think on my feet? Mm -hmm. How can I be an out-of-the-box right. thinker right. to kill the enemy? Yeah. But also when it's not necessary to kill the enemy. Yeah. Right? Yeah, no. I mean, absolutely. Like, you can give Green Beret a problem. We've got 500 pounds problem of Problem solvers. You've got $50. And I want to meet you in Havana. Tomorrow. Or in Arizona. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. And then not only will they get there, 
They'd right. be like, they'd be doing shots. They'll, they'll, have a, they'll have a drink with a yeah. with a with a little uh, umbrella on it. No. Right. No, but, no, but th- that's true, though. I mean, right? Yeah, it's the relentless desire to accomplish the mission, and if the mission is designed right, adapt, overcome. Right. Yeah, and and also just like the special forces slogan is just you know they're trying to liberate the oppressed. What a better mission than that? You know, like that's their that's their thing. Right. Right. So when you go through your book and you have all these insights from guys like Terry and Jay, yeah. but also, you know, Mark Cuban and all the, all, I mean, all, there's so many incredible I, I got a great Mark Cuban story. Mm. I know you're going to ask me a question, but I'm going to tell you a really cool no, story. No, it's a conversation. So yeah. the biggest bugaboo for this whole project is there were 48 individuals, myself and my partner being two that made 50. We had to get photos, their submission. Yeah. We had to get a short bio. And we had to get a release, a oh, legal yeah. release. Now, we had Warren Buffett in the book. Yeah. Warren Buffett. Yes. And he sent me an email, or actually, I think he sent it to my partner, and said, you can use me in the book. But the publisher was like, no, you must have an actual legal release for Warren Buffett, which he wouldn't sign. And I don't blame him. Yeah. So we didn't have Cubans either. We had an email. Oh, so man. my partner calls Cubes up. Yeah. And he's like, Mark, I need your thing. You know what he did? He was at a Mavs game. Yeah. He goes, Doc, you send it to me. He, I mean, this is Mark Cuban. Yeah. He's not sending this to all of his legal team. Yeah. He goes, blah, 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 blah. So the essence of this story is that a guy of Mark Cuban's level right. did not say, oh, my God, you have to send this to my lawyer. Blah, 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 blah. He's like, signed it, done. Yeah. And I think what that says about Mark Cuban is in business, I think when you can create an expediency, and I would imagine what you do, you need to know when something needs to be done immediately and without bullshit. Yeah. That's how you get it done. And Mark was like, okay, I get you guys need this. You need it now. I'm going to do it for you. He, right. Part of it was he was kind to do it. Of course. But like, he was like, I'm signing this, done. Because he knew if not, we weren't going to be able to use them in the, in the book. And I, I just think that's what makes a billionaire. That's yeah. what makes a winner. And this guy was like, okay, I see what needs to be done to make this happen. Yeah. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. And I I just think that's what makes a billionaire. That's what makes a winner. And this guy was like, okay, I see what needs to be done to make this happen yeah i mean this is like what commanders do right like if i right. can provide them a tiny hurdle that they have the ability to not only get over but smash it like whatever i can smash it i can lift it and throw it i can go over it and do whatever right but if i can present it and like it's how you present it yeah and then they go oh, this is all we got to do done 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 don't don't tell me what to do just give me the obstacle give, give, give me the obstacle let me yeah yeah overcome it and i was really blown away that he did that because my point was circling back God, getting 48 very successful, very powerful individuals that are on often different continents to, like, do what you need to get done was really tough. So let me ask you this about that. Someone that talks to a lot of very notable people, myself, the ability to communicate with Warren Buffett, for example, he may respond immediately to your message, but immediately for him is five days later. Because here's the interesting thing about Warren Buffett. That's her. Warren Buffett is like, I never don't respond to somebody by the end of the day. Yeah, okay. And that is, it's the devil's in the details. And if you can take something that we were a very little thing on Warren Buffett's plate, right? but if you can take the little things and make them important, you certainly can take the big things and make them important. And, I mean, I was blown away that that guy responded to us. What have you changed about your life since writing this book? I'm going to tell you, I needed something in my life. I needed something. And I said to myself, I'm writing a book about success. This is my OCD kicking in. I have to like put that there. (laughs) I said, I need to walk it like a talk it. And I was overweight. There were things I wasn't doing that I needed to do. Yeah. And this book was the impetus for me to address some issues I needed to address. Yeah. I tried to lose weight for a really long time. Yeah. And I don't know how I did it, but I just was like, 
you know, I tried the keto. I tried blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And then I finally kind of got it together. And that was part of it. Mm. I started this new thing. There's this book called The Morning Miracle. Have you heard of this? Yeah. It's the Morning Miracle basically is this guy named Hal Elrod that wrote this book. And he's like, you can change your life by getting up early in the morning. And I was a guy, as an actor, if you don't have something to do, say an audition or you're filming, it's real easy to be like, I'm sleeping until 11. Yeah. And I was like, that. I go, I'm done. I go, I'm getting up at six every day. Nice. Military. Yeah. And I started getting up at six. And I wrote a um, kind of a mantra thing, okay? I mean, I, I've never been a real religious guy. And I started praying every morning. And I'm not, this is not like about the God Squad or whatever. But I sort of wrote out what my prayer was. And then I wrote out this, this, remember the thing I told you about, he lives in wisdom, who sees himself. I would take 30 minutes in my morning and I would do that. And then I would watch this crazy video about basically success. Yeah. It really made a profound change in my life. Yeah. As we progress through middle age, our system requires more maintenance. I, I, buddy, I got news for you. You yeah. and I are not middle-aged. Well, okay, how many people live to be 110? Well, <laughs> you and I are not middle aged. Right, well, we're not in our youth. Right? We're not, okay. But you know what though? You can still. Listen I'm not to saying me. you can't, but what I'm, I'm saying. I'm better now than I was, and I'm okay with that, right? Yeah, I'm fighting that. But what I'm saying is, that we have to care for our system more, right? Like, my question is, is as you try to care for your spirit, your mental well being, your yeah. physical well being, like you know, it's easy to not realize that, like, oh, I've not actually done any maintenance on all these parts of my person thank you You know my sean needs a yeah. lot more spirituality you and know, whether it's from kinda, god or I something else what really? happened i sort of you know i've always been a kind of a physical guy and i just sort of was like wow i put f- fucking 40 pounds on yeah and i still i'm one of those guys that like i still look like i still look pretty good yeah but i was like i didn't look like i, I you'd see pictures it, one of the things that really sucks about being an actor yeah is the internet keeps a chronology of what you look like yeah. and i was like Fuck. I, go, I don't look like that anymore and i go my wife is loving and doesn't really say anything but i go that's not what she signed up for yeah and i was like you know and i and i tried and tried and tried all these ways to kind of lose the weight and everything and then i i just kind of figured it out and i was like the book was the impetus right. for me to make a profound change and it worked. It really worked. And it also just, it made me want to be better than yeah. what I was. I was like, I'm writing a book about success. Yeah. How dare you? How dare you right. not be successful? You're a phony then. Right. You know, you're a freaking phony. And I was like, I'm not going to be that guy. That's some character showing. I like Right. It. Where does Sean need most of his work? Like where, when you look at you as a person. That's easy. All right. I need to... Be, I need my wife to shut up. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Oh my God, she's, a joke. she's no, the I'm just no, but I mean, she's the single, she's the single greatest, best, most amazing thing that's ever happened in my life. She, she changed my life. Yeah, I was a guy that was definitely headed for not some great stuff. Yeah, and you know, you know, and my first marriage was a horrible marriage. It was a bad marriage, and I thought maybe. That's the guy I am. Maybe I'm not a great guy. Yeah. Maybe that's who I am. And when I married Michelle, I decided that my marriage was really important to me. Yeah. And that being a good, committed, loving partner was really important to me. And I was like, holy shit. I go, maybe I'm not that guy. Maybe I'm this guy. Yeah. And do you know what I mean? And, and I you, do. you know, as you get older, our age. You'll learn this. Not middle age. No, but you'll learn this. You'll you'll learn that you're 22. You're going to be like, oh, well, maybe this is just how I am. This is who I am. And I was like, maybe this is how I am. And when you start making changes at a, at a later point in your life, it's startling because you're like, I didn't think I could make a change when you're a 40, 50-year-old guy. You go, fuck it. That's, how, that's who I am. I'm sorry. I don't mean to swear. You, you go, that's, that's who I am. And when you learn that's not who you are, you go, well, that's really cool. I'm not that guy. I was just falling into some bad habits. Yeah, in many ways, this book kind of really helped me. I have a bad temper. Okay. I am quick to become emotional and reactive, which I'm trying not to be. I'm trying to be less reactive. That's about it, though. I've made a lot of progress in my life. Yeah. It's not 
like I have a bad temper, like I'm a tough guy. It's not that. It's I have a reactive personality sometimes, which comes from defensiveness. Yeah. Which when I was a kid, I was a fat kid. I was a fat kid. And I really wish I had my phone to show you because I carried this picture around in me when I was the fat kid. Yeah. And instead of hating this little kid, which I used to, I used to hate him because it represented all the weakness that I had in me. I love him now. I love this kid. I love this little fat kid. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of that, though. I mean, we all have a lot of that. You know, we all hate the fat kid or we hate the kid with glasses or. I had a bull haircut. I had glasses, <laughs> yeah. and I was fat. And I have a very specific picture of me. It's not like, oh, I was this fat kid. No, I have a absolute picture of me of when I was that kid. Yeah. And I for so long I hated him. I hated him, and now I don't. I don't. I I, I recognize him as this scared little kid. I was thinking about a movie idea that I had, you know, and, and I'm not trying to write it. So I'm just fun to talk about it. But my girlfriend is someone who I've known a lot of my early life. We went to high school together, grew up together, but we were never like an item at all. We would beat the same party, but never in the same social circles. And then all of a sudden we, I organized our reunion 30 year and we connected and something happened. And now we're in love and it's something ridiculous. Happened. Yes. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> well, the magic happened, right? The magic. In a lot of ways she saved me, you know, like. I was on a path of destruction, you know, PTSD and everything. I know, right? Yeah. Dude, I mean, I mean, I can't relate to what you must have gone through, but, but destruction I was, is destruction. I was on a path. Yeah. I was on a path of destruction, but not to make it back about me, but yeah. I was It, it is about you. I'm one No, but I'm one of those guys who like even when I give 10%, I'm still doing pretty well. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can totally identify with that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then and then that creates an arrogance. Mhm. Mm and you're like, you know, I'm yeah. Yeah. I'm always trying to be one notch below arrogance and one notch below aloof. Yeah, and, I, I get it. I get it. But because that's, that's, I have to realize that that's where I'm at. And then I have to be mindful of where the, not to, not to hit the rev limiter on that and back it down, you know? And I've worked hard at that. That's where I work a right, lot. Right. And then my fat kid, I have right. that, you know, where I'm and like, that's a, that's a whole weird thing, man. Yeah. It's like, if you don't understand that. Right. And then I went, when I was 13, I went from getting, being fat kid to getting contact lenses, suddenly girls were very interested in me because I literally, my looks changed dramatically. Huh. But I was still the fat kid. It's a psychic shift in the sense that in my head, I look like this fat kid. And now suddenly all these beautiful girls that would never give me the time of day wanted to yeah. sleep with me. Yeah. But I was still the fat I couldn't kind of blah, blah, blah. I like to think I'm a good guy. And I think one of the reasons I think I'm a good guy is because I knew what it was like to be the fat kid. Yeah. And one thing I hate, maybe it's why you're a soldier. I hate cruelty. I hate bullies. Yeah. I don't like when somebody's picked on. Yeah. Because I was picked on. So before we started recording, you talked about, and this is a common thing, so you shouldn't feel like in any way that it's, it's weird at all, but you wish you would have served. You have I a, do. A, I you do. have a hole there, right? With all my heart. Tito Ortiz is like, can I go to basic training and just show you guys that I could do it? And I'm like, Tito, it's, it's, you, it's you've it's, that's done part, it. That's, that's, but that's part of it. Yeah. I want to know, could I have done it? Yeah. I don't know. I, th I think every man wants to believe he could do it. Talk about the last moment where it was possible for you to have joined. Like some, you know, here's the thing. It was never, ever, ever something that was a possibility for me in the sense that okay. I think a lot of guys that are military guys come from a military family. My grandfather, who was part of the greatest generation, was in World War II. Yeah. But my dad, God love him, was, I think, a deferred guy. Like, it, yeah. wasn't, it wasn't something that, like, I ever considered. Yeah. I'm the same way. I, I, I had and no I, intention. And, and, and now that I'm older, now I just, I just wish I would have. Um, so when you say to me, when was the last time I could have, it, 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 there was never a cutoff date because it was never a viable option. It was never a viable. I mean, of course it was people, people who listen to this go, well, of course no, it was no, asshole. But... Do you remember the, it wasn't the draft, but it was the selective service. Yeah. And I remember my dad taking me down to the post office <laughs> Yeah. and I was proud, which is a weird place to go. My do dad, this. my dad took me to the post office Yeah. and I signed up for the selective service. And I remember at that moment. I was proud. I was proud to do it. That's a right of passage. And I was a kid. Yeah. I was a kid. Yeah. Now, I also remember I did the last Perry Mason movie ever with Raymond Burr. Really? And I did it with a guy named Michael Nader. Okay. And he was Dex Dexter on Dynasty. 
Okay. And he told me, he goes, he goes, I remember when they wanted me for Vietnam, he goes, I pretended I was gay. Yeah. And it was a legitimate fear, I guess is the right word. Yeah. When I was doing the Perry Mason movie with this guy that it was, it was Iraq one. And I was like, they may call me up. Yeah. And that, that's how that, that's how that conversation started. Sure. Sure. And yeah. I was like, and I always, I always wondered, do you ever see a movie called tribes? No. Uh-uh. So Dude, good. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hip you to something. Nice. You're going to watch it. And this is why we became friends. All right. So it stars Jan Michael Vincent. Oh, nice. And, I love Jan. And, and Jan Michael Vincent plays a hippie and he gets inducted in the Marines. And what was the guy who was, remember the Night Stalker, Cole Shack, the Night Stalker, Darren McGavin. Okay. He plays his gunny. Yeah. And he can't break this kid. Yeah. And the kid teaches, like, he goes in the military and he teaches, like, they have to hold the buckets up. Yeah. But he's, like, fantasizing about his beautiful girlfriend on the beach. And slowly but surely, this gunny, they see this kid, this hippie, as rebellious, but he starts to love him. Yeah. And it's this crazy fucking thing. And he's like, don't you understand? You can't, you can't be this guy in the Marines. Mm. He goes, you have to be this guy. And he's like, why, man? Why, why do it's the most beautiful movie. Yeah. It's called Tribes. Okay. And and he and he's the best Marine. Yeah. He's when they put him with the uh, what do you call it? Pugil sticks. Pugil sticks. Yeah. He kills everybody. Yeah, yeah. But he's like not a fighter. He's just like he's just like this. And and there's a there's a another drill sergeant who is like, you got to get this lady under control. Yeah. And he's like, but what if I don't? What if he's right? Yeah. And it's this whole crisis. Of, it's yeah. Tribes. That's Please awesome. watch this and text me. Okay. It's a beautiful, crazy movie. Yeah. Going back to what I was saying was I always wondered, would I be the guy with the mega horn on the mall in Washington uh-huh. fighting against the Vietnam War? Right. Or would I have been the soldier? And I think if I had to say it, I'd been the soldier. I would have done my duty. When we look back yeah. at all of the questionable choices policy wise and the, you know, the lies the all these things has it changed how we look at those guys who fought it and turned out to be in a lot of way right because it's hard right it's easy to go you're cowards but in reality they fought their own version of the war yeah. some, some oh, of these guys I, left I, our I, country i, I, I completely you know? agree yeah i completely agree this and, whole uh, uh, thing about uh, draft my, dodging is hard you know here's the thing and, and I, I don't completely understand this and some of what i'm about to say is from the movie with the uh, uh, Nicholas Cage. What was it? Um, yeah, I was running Black yeah. Ops back. Put, oh, some, yeah, there you put go. some rigging tape on. That. Yeah. No, but I mean, I mean, we the were rock. the rock. We, we were in. Yeah, the rock. We were in Cambodia. Yeah. Fucking shit up in China yeah. Yeah. when we really weren't supposed to. Yeah. And it's like, and yet still not right. Not committing to the win. Right, right. So, so I, I don't know. Man. Were we wrong? I those guys. There's a guy we had on the show, them. and he's fantastic. You would love to meet him. His name is John McKay, and he was a young guy. And he's like kind of a Forrest Gump guy. In that he was in all of these things that happened. They were crazy, and he's like, as a young officer, I was able to go to Vietnam and kind of observe. And I recognized then that it was we were not doing the things it was going to take to win, but I still went. So that means the mirror image of him is the guy that said, I recognize we weren't going to win. And I said, no. Right. I have to say this. and I did not want to talk about politics during this, right. but I feel whatever you feel about Trump. Yeah. And there's certainly lots of things to feel about Trump. Yeah. I feel that him taking the constraints of the rules of engagement. I think that is one of the most amazing, brilliant things that this president has done. Because you're taking our guys that are heroes, that are that they're the best warriors on the planet, and saying you can't fight to win. Yeah, you have to. a lot of that. Secretary matters too. So I want to know your. Safe. I want to know your thoughts because I'm getting the sense that like, because the younger generation, you guys are like millennials. I think on a lot of levels, you guys resent us because you think our generation is out of touch. And whatever, and we see your generation, and when I say we, actually, him seeing my generation sees you guys as you know you have the luxury of being I don't say hippy dippy. It's not that, but it's like you have the luxury of being. I mean, for sure, the greatest generation was the greatest generation. I'm sorry. I mean, they beat the Nazis. Thank you. Yeah. 
They beat the Nazis. And, and the Depression. And, the, yeah. and they came back. And there's a reason why guys came back from, they came back and became titans of business. You know what I mean? I mean, there just was something special about them. And I get every generation looks at the previous generation as like with disdain. It's just a fact. It's like, you know what I mean? I mean, what do you think? I mean, do you think like we're, I don't know, not, not Trumpy and whatever, but it's like, like we look at it like you didn't have to serve in the military. Right. Now, as a guy that hasn't served in the military, I need to shut my mouth, but you can't not respect what your father's done. Sure, yeah. Right? Yeah. Because you know what? If not him, who? Right. And go. <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily, I think mostly with the younger generations, it's more. You're wrong. Yeah. It's more. Uh, he doesn't have the microphone, though, so he's good. <laughs> it's more maybe resentment towards, like, the boomers. Since that's Which is my dad's generation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But resentment, why? More just, like, I guess it's more just that battle between, like, the millennials and the boomers. Like, boomers think that millennials have it easy. Okay, this is a crazy question. But sure. Do you think some of it is, like, I remember what it was like not to have a cell phone. Sure. Not to have an ATM. Sure. We didn't have tech. Like right. you guys, so on some level, I think you guys think, maybe rightfully so, we're like the cavemen. My point is, like, you guys understand technology. I mean, and we're sort of like the dinosaurs. Right. And does that create a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a, not resentment, but like, you guys are morons. I think, yeah, there's just two different worlds. We haven't, like, found a way to kind of understand how one side has had it hard, but another side has had it hard because of, just it's not even like gen x is like fault either it's just whatever happened before them but is you, just trying to do fix you get what it. i'm yeah. saying it's like we can yeah. look at you and go okay you guys haven't like you're entitled pulled your, you're entitled you, you haven't it, had to and work you guys can look enough. at us like we're yeah i mean and there is a there's definitely a generational gap because that, that's what that's the word that's what it's looking at because there yeah we, we've known parents or we ourselves were poor you know relatively speaking i mean they're super poor but in now it's like everybody has a cell phone. They're the first, the millennials, and Brenda is um, yeah, Gen Z, right? Whatever they're going to be called. Gen Z, right. And either somewhere in the middle of Gen Z and the millennials, they're really our first cyborg generation. You have this robot with you at right, all the time. Right, right, and, right, right. And you don't have to remember phone numbers. You don't have to remember a bank account number. Remember you said, remember that, you know? It's, it's different what now. You're saying. So what you're saying is they have it easy because they don't have to remember it like we do. And we're like, we're like, it allows us to accomplish so much more that we don't even have to think about that stupid shit. And both are valid. Yeah. Not arguments, but both are valid, you know, arguments. Yeah. So let me, yeah. we're getting close to an hour now. No, first off, this has been great. I love it. I love it that you're comfortable and free enough to have a conversation and, and get into these topics because, well, I mean, we didn't even talk about it, the Italian um, dance show that you were on, you know? Talk about whatever you want. Well, we'll, we'll get, speed through it. Yeah. Well, no, but it's neat. So as you're looking ahead, right, you've been in. Oh, by the way, as everybody knows, not just an author, you're also an actor. You've been in a ton of movies. And one of the things I love is to not, like, characterize you as uh, the guy who was in Karate Kid 3 because right. that was Thank decades you. ago. Right. So we're talking about where you're at now, and you've written this book. Is there another one coming? What, what else is that? Because you're, you're learning languages. Yeah, so we gotta, you're we not another... a sit-stiller. You're a doer. No, I'm, I'm not a sit-stiller. No, we have a um, another project which is going to be called Success Factor Y, mm. and why is your younger self? What letter would you write to your younger self to give yourself advice? Yeah. So we're already working on that. Nice. I just signed on to do another film. I'm doing it. I've never done a sci-fi film, and I've right. always wanted to do a sci-fi film. So I'm I'm doing a sci-fi, and I'm playing an ex-military guy. Nice. Right. So I'm going to sh- be shooting that starting August 31st in Joshua Tree. Post-apocalyptic or it's not really post-apocalyptic. It's it's a, about a Martian colony sort of thing. Okay. I'm always trying to do other things that push me. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got the book thing. I've got another film that I'm doing. We're launching a podcast. Nice. Uh, we're gonna do a Success Factor X podcast. You should. I'm real involved with being a father to my daughter who's gonna be 18 next month. Yeah. Tell me about that because one of the things that I've had to learn with Brenna is how to be I'm still a dad, still a father. But I can't be too much of those things. I'm more of a guide now. 
right? Except for when we drive in L.A. Yeah, yeah. I got to yell at her. No, but it's like you you don't need to be like, I'm dad. It's, mm-hmm. it's like, look, you know, at it, it 22, but here's the thing. It's like, it's not that you need a friend because there is still that thing where you're the father. So my wife has four kids and I have one. And I always go, my job is not to be your friend. Doesn't mean that I can't yeah. be your friend. But my job is not to be your friend. My job is to be your parent. And, but you know, it's interesting. Like, listen to what your dad just said. Like, it's a struggle. It's like, it's like, am I, am I the yeah. dad? Am I the friend? And my job is not to make you like me. I don't care if you like me as your father. Yeah. You know what? You may not like me sometimes. I don't like me sometimes. But my job is to be the guy when you walk down a dark alley. I'm going to be there for you and take care of business and protect you and love you. And sometimes, sometimes because you're at 22 and you don't have the 30,000 square yeah. foot view that we have because we're old men, you need to shut up and understand that what we're saying is only and always in your best interest. But also, we're confused and trying to figure it out too. <laughs> And learn right? the, yeah, we're, we're trying to learn and figure Absolutely. it out too. Yes, but Brenda, if you get into a physical confrontation and you want it to end, what do you do? What's your first thing? What have I taught you? That's right. Jam your thumb to the back of their eye socket. No one likes that. Nobody. That's right. Nobody likes that. Yeah. If you're on a beach with a margarita, there's that, and then getting an eye socket. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody likes that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, listen, man, we got to do more of these things. Okay. This is the last thing I'm going to tell Please, you Please, let's this do is it. My, my last thing. So the other day, about two days ago, I come out here outside, and there's a guy with a GoPro, and he's screaming and yelling, and he's like, obviously, like a, a, a mentally, he's got problems. Yeah. And so, of course, I look, I, you know, I have to engage, and I look at him, and he's like, hey, I've got Asperger's, and he's like, if you mess with me, da 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 This is not the funny part of the story. Yeah. From this restaurant, a guy dressed as old school Adam West Batman comes out. All right. And I'm like, he tries to like brace this guy. So I'm like, are you kidding me? There's a guy <laughs> dressed like Batman who comes out and talks to this guy yeah. out on the street. Yeah. And you're at the restaurant where it happens. <laughs> End of story. That's perfect. <laughs>